The coalition of the willing. That's why I used Exodus just a minute ago to take the offering because it's so important in this day that we understand your will is stronger than God. Your will is more powerful than God. When God created man, he gave man the ability to say yes or say no. The animals don't have that. Trees don't have that. No other creation has that. Even the angels don't have that. But you and I were given a free will to say, no, I don't want God. Or, I want God on my own terms. That's where the world is today. And because of that, our will, which is made up of your, your, is part of your uh, soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, is part of your suke, that's part of your soul. And your soul has this conflict going on between God and, in yourself, man. And because of that, you have a free will, and this word fits into this whole perspective here. And I'll say it again. It was called a coalition of the willing. Now, this is what a team is. A team is a coalition, a temporary union for a common purpose. That's what a team, a coalition is, a temporary union for a common purpose. And like a team of horses refers to the harnessing together of multitudes of an, uh, multiple animals who combine their strengths and their efforts and, uh, uh, and effect can do exponentially, exponentially can do more work than one could do alone. How many of you hear that? Yeah. And how many of you know we live in a society today that is about individuality? Come on. I'm my own man. I do my own thing. And, you know, some of these kids today, I've always laughed at it because, you know, they, they wear these outfits, you know, they wear the baggy football shirts or whatever's in today, and it might change in three, three minutes, you know, so whatever. And they wear, we saw a guy the other day walk in front of us at the stoplight downtown, kind of a chubby guy, and uh, he had his pants on, and by the time he got across the street, his pants were off. And he was doing this. Now, I, I, I understand now why so many get attacked and shot and everything else. They can't run. Man, in my day, you know, we had tight leg pants. Our blue jeans cleared our tennis shoes about like this. They were called high water pants. You know what I'm talking about, right? We had them, and they were tight peg leg. I don't care if you were big or little, they were tight. So and the, the reason was we were fast. We could move. I was running from the police and I was uh, hiding out in Los Angeles. And I had a uh, credit card I'd stolen and I was living at a hotel on my, on my stolen credit card. I was living it up. And I was like the, the uh, you know, what was the guy living up, you know? Um, what was his name, you know? Jefferson's. I was living it up, moving on up, man. I was doing it. And um, there was across the street, I was living on Sunset Strip, across the street from the Whiskey A Go Go. That's where I saw uh, the first time that uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix played. They announced him. We were sitting in the room and they said, There's a guy tonight, he's new. We're just going to bring him up and let him do a few things. He's just new on the circuit. His name is Jimi Hendrix. And this spiny, skinny, freaked out guy gets up there and turned that guitar into this thing. And I mean, and we were sure, you know, back then we were right into it. And uh, remember Elvis, Jimmy Brown, all kinds of people, you know, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the big leagues now. And I remember there was a group of hell's angels across the street. And I walked out and walked down the street and these hell's angels, I didn't know who they were. I'm from a beach town. And they were sitting on their motorcycles, you know, and they had their chains and they had their beards and they had all the jazz. And I, they walked by and one of them said something to me. And I said something back to him, like, you want some of this? <laughs> and here I am in my skinny little peg leg pants with my little tennis shoes on. I got them laughing so hard that it saved my life. 
Now, we, we did that so we could run. Long story. Now, come back to my story. And the point being is, is this, is that a coalition uh, of the willing, here's something to look at now. It's really important that we get this. Like a group of horses coming together, it's a team. Uh, First Chronicles 28, 9. Uh, it says, with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. That's what God's looking for. A heart that's set before him, perfect towards him, and a willing mind. Psalms uh, 110 verse 3 said, the people shall be willing in the day of battle. How many of you know there's, there's got to come in our hearts a willingness today? Because I mentioned to you in January, watch night service, I, I mentioned to you that the number 13 is the number rebellion. And one of the things that is prevalent today is the do your own thing culture. It is my culture. It is my thing. It is my agenda. It is my, my, my. Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has, you know, their own, uh, their own, their own laptop, their own iPod, their own uh, Galaxy, whatever. They all have their own, own, own. You get your own domain number. You get your own, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, uh, we can get on Facebooks and Twitters and all the new ones, and I have no clue. I've never tweeted once. I've never been on Facebook that I know about. I have been on, but that wasn't my doing. People put me on. They found a picture in Hawaii of me with a group of guys, and they sent it all over the place. Anyway, it is, you know, I, mug shots. Anyway, but those electronic tools, I don't play with them, don't use them. The only Facebook I have is my face and his book anyway. But the point being is this, is that those instruments are prevailing today to make us a culture that does not need to come together, we think. And more and more and more, we get ourselves separated. We get ourselves independent. I want to talk to you today about what I believe the Bible says that is contrary to that and a contradiction to that and what the church needs to experience in this hour as the nation. How many believe the nation, the politicians that have 9% uh, 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 popularity rate or whatever, how many believe they need to come together? How many believe the Democrats and the Republicans need to get together? I mean, there's a lot of bills that are just floating around going nowhere that pertain to us as life and I'd like to see them just shut up a minute and go work together. Hello? And, and it's that way across the board. How many of you know that nations and uh, Israel and, and uh, Iran and all these, they're just stuck in this, my, my, I want it my way. Are you listening? Isaiah 119 says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the fat or the best of the land. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 says, you must have a willing mind if you're going to give. You got to have a willing mind, willing mind first. Your mind's got to be willing. Now go to Titus in your Bible, the book of Titus chapter 3. The book of Titus chapter 3. Now it's real important that you follow me today because this has to do with a continuation of things. So what I'm preaching Thursday nights, a leak over into here. What I'll preach uh, this coming Thursday night is kind of a carryover, et cetera, et cetera. Type, Titus chapter 3 and verse 12. And uh, I want to read this to you and uh, uh, help you get a grip on something here that I believe will help you. Now, uh, this is Paul writing to his son uh, Titus. It is over in Corinthians chapter 8, that Paul refers to this, so it's connected, okay? And he says something here, and I'm going to read it to you. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychus, uh, be diligent to come to me at Nicop Nic Nicopolis, uh, Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter here or there. Send Zenus the lawyer. Interesting and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may, may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may, be, may not be unfruitful. Let me see that. Mm -hmm. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who, lo uh, who love us in the faith. Grace with you all. Amen. 
So Paul, the great apostle, he writes this letter to this young man, Titus, and he gives him, now this is the final word that Titus gets from Paul. Paul dies after this. So this is pretty important for Paul, I mean for young Titus to really get a hold of what he's saying. And he says, one translation says, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. How many of you know that God's concerned about his people not producing fruit? I've preached it before, and I'll reiterate this to you. God is concerned when people aren't fruitful. How do I know that? Genesis chapter 1 tells us. Genesis chapter 2 tells us. When God made man, he made him and he gave him a command. He said, go, be fruitful, and multiply. Have you hear that? So an a, a, a order of God for human race was that we would multiply and that we would increase all the more. How many of you hear that? And also, if you're looking throughout the Bible, you'll find Jesus comes along one day with the disciples. He comes to a fig tree, and the fig tree, he says, when he comes back, that fig tree better be producing fruit. When he comes back, the fig tree has no fruit, and Jesus curses the fig tree, fig tree and the fig tree dries up and, and completely rots and is dead. How many of you hear that? And how many of you know the Bible says in John uh, chapter 15, herein is the Father glorified that you bear much fruit. God is interested today that you and I become fruitful, not just faithful, but fruitful. A lot of people are faithful, but they're never fruitful. You can be faithful. You can be there all the time, but never do anything to bring increase or to bring supply or to bring something addition to what you are part of. Are you listening to me today? Amen. How many of you believe that God wants you to be fruitful? Yes. How many of you know that he made man? That's why the agenda of the homosexual uh, uh, small group in America and the, in the world is really a negative drain on the intent of God because they can't become fruitful. Yes. Not according to the Bible. The Bible says they were to go and reproduce. Yes. And man and man can't reproduce. Woman and woman can't reproduce. So it contradicts God. Are you listening to me? That has nothing to do with, and don't go in there. It doesn't have nothing to do with, well, you know, judging people and their free will to choose the lifestyle they want or all that kind of business. You can be anything you want to be. If you want to be an idiot, you can be an idiot. If you want to be anything. How many of you watch TV? How many of you know those are people that chose to be idiots? And you watch them and they just, they chose it. So you just, you can't stop them. How many of you hear that? But how many of you know, saints, we're not talking about a will to choose to become something contrary. I'm talking about a will to choose to become what God wants you to become. Yeah. And there is a vast difference here today. God wants us to be fruitful and that what we put our hands to, he only has you alive on the earth so that you can replenish the earth with his intent. Amen. Do you understand that? When you're reproducing for no reason, uh, you have no purpose. Amen. Do you understand that? Yes. When you don't know the purpose of a thing, you'll abuse the thing. Yes. Hello? Right. If I don't know the purpose of something, I don't know what to do with the thing I have. Right. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people today don't know what to do with a marriage. So they don't know what the purpose of marriage is, so they abuse the marriage. A lot of people don't know what to do with children, so they abuse the children because they don't know what the purpose of a child is. Yeah. Are you listening to me? But we need today to say, wait a minute. I need to know that I'm on the earth. God put me here. I have a purpose. Uh, and if I, I hear people all the time, I want to know what my purpose is. I want to know what my, well, let me help you. Multiply. 
oh, I'm having babies. No, 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 no. I don't mean just babies. I'm talking about multiply this book. Multiply the reality of this book in your life so that anyone around you, then they will be recipient of your multiplication or increase. Hello? How do you know that you can have peace the world can't have? And you need to be able to have that to give it away. How many of you know you have joy? Jesus said, I give you my joy. He said, I'm going to give you some joy that comes down inside. Ain't because of a joke. Ain't because of an event. Joy is not happenstance. That's happiness. Joy comes uh, in the morning when you don't feel like it. Joy comes from the Holy Ghost. Uh, Joy comes when you've lost something and joy comes in. Joy came in the person. Are you listening to me today? Peace comes in the person. Faith comes, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And how many of you know, you say, I, 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 need, I need to get something so that I know how to take it in and so that when I take it in, it will cause a germination to happen so that I'll become fruitful and I'll multiply. Now, we're talking about the coalition of the willing. Don't forget this. So Paul writes this letter, and he tells this guy that they, uh, T- uh, Titus, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives. Paul, catch this, Paul's words to Titus are the reflection of the war that they were engaged in, okay? How many of you know it's similar to our war today? The church is in a war. The church is in a a controversy. How many know Paul was in jail because of where his faith was? Come on with me. Paul didn't do anything. Paul wasn't in jail because he shot somebody. Paul wasn't in jail because he stole something. Paul was in jail because he believed in someone. Are you listening? And I can tell you today, there's some people I personally know right now are going to go to jail because of their faith. There's people that have decided uh, that they're not going to go along with certain things that put a demand that I have to support certain abortion laws and certain abortion practices and that. And there's some people that are going to go to jail. You mark it down. We're going to know people today that will be arrested and go to jail. And it'll seem to be unfair because they're going to target people are you listening and we need to understand that Paul was addressing something in the middle of a war in the culture and this applies to us today we're in a cultural war today would you believe that all right now Paul made great gains because he was working with the coalition though of the willing You see, the reason that the early church was so successful, they didn't have iPads and computers and phones and things, but they were so successful was they had what we don't have. They had a coalition of the willing. We have a coalition of the informed. We have a coalition of the complainers. We have a coalition uh, made up uh, of a lot of brain people, a lot of smart people. Are you listening? Or maybe a coalition of the comfortable or a coalition uh, of the complacent. We have a lot of coalitions. But Paul had a coalition of the willing. Look who he had present on the boat, in the trip, on on the road. He has Apollos and he has Zenos. These are two men. Are they different? How many of you know Apollos is the one that was preaching and was talking about baptisms and those kind of things in the book of Corinthians? Right. And Zenith was what? He was a lawyer. Yes, lawyers can be saved, so that's evidence. <laughs> that should encourage us. <laughs> How many understand that they, they, the coalition that Paul had brought together was what was making a difference in Greece And in all this region, Titus chapter 3, verse 12 and 15, as I said a minute ago, it's a study of Paul's intentional plan to raise up an apostolic team, and he was raising up a people, a coalition of the willing. Now, you come with me. You're going to see something in just a minute. I'm going to to show you something, so don't, don't drop out yet. We're not successful when we're doing our own thing. Come on. How many of you in here today? 
Yes. How many are glad you're alive? Yes. How many of you are listening? Yes. We're not successful when we're doing our own thing. How many you know in a marriage, when you do your own thing, that marriage is not successful? Yes. How many you know that on a, on, a, on a sports team, you do your own thing, that team's not successful? Yes. How many of you know on, on, in anything, if this band has an individual in the band that says, I want to play this song this way, and the rest of the band is trying to play it another way, how many you know they're going to have a problem? How many of you know it's the same thing with singers? You've got different kinds of singers, people that have different octaves and different voices, and those people have to learn how to put their voices together so that it comes out in a nice sound. How many of you hear that? Yeah. How many of you have ever heard somebody off beat? Oh, Lord. Oh, my God. I mean, I, I, I sometimes suffer when I hear people that sing, and they're singing this monotone, flat, Oh, my gosh. I know the Lord says make a joyful noise, but I, I just can't find any joy in it. That's why I say if you're going to join the worship team, at least do one thing. Say you know how to sing. It's like if you're going to join the cooking team, I want you to know how to cook. No experiments allowed. Hello. Come on, are you with me today now? We are not just a worshiping church or a theatrical play setting kind of church or an evangelistic force or a great compassionate arm of Jesus. Uh, we are all those things because we are a coalition, a team of the willing. How many of you know that Paul and the disciples did awesome things? They turned nations upside down. Why is it the church in America having the kind of effect it should be having? Because you don't have people that are willing. You have selfish, self-centered individuals that want it on their agenda and their time. Hello? And because of it, there's a lack in the church of unity. There's a lack of the church coming together. There's a lack of the church preferring one another. There's a lack in the church uh, to say, come on, I'm part of this. I'm an elbow. I'm a, I'm a kneecap. I'm a hand. I'm part of the body. And I want to function together. Have you hear that? The church is never going to be impacting until we can change it. One of the things you notice in the street, saints, is the gangs in the street. That's the only thing they have going for them. They come together. Now, how many of you know Michael Jordan? Anybody here today? Help me preach a little bit, but at least I could get mannequins and paint happy faces on them, but you know... I chose to let you come in church today. So since you're not a mannequin, how about, how about like ah, open, you know, yes, I'm here. Turn to the person, will you? Take the wrist, feel it. See if they're alive for me, would you? I don't want any dead people here. You can't find the living amongst the dead, amen? Come on, saints. Are you alive? How many of you glad you're alive? Amen. How many of you like to be sitting in a funeral home right now? <laughs> All right, come on. Living people act like you got life at least for the next 20 minutes. Now, in that statement, how many of you know Michael Jordan? Yes. Thank you. Thought you were from another planet. Now, was arguably the best player probably in NBA history. Okay? In the early days with the Chicago Bulls, Michael was a scoring machine. And I mean, I'm talking about a machine. I grew up and I was able to be at that age in time when Michael was with the bullets. And, and I mean, I mean, not bullets, the um, bulls. And oh my gosh, you know, if he got the ball, you just knew your team will not going to win. I mean, Michael was a one man show. Now his coach, who is a coach of coaches at that time, uh, Phil Jackson, he asked Michael to do something that was really amazing and stunned the whole sports world. He went to Michael and he asked him something that you just can't imagine a coach even asking. It seems that the team winning, team's winning percentage was far better when Michael scored fewer than 30 points per game. How could that be? When Michael scored in the 30-point range, it meant other players had to step up and carry more of the load. 
So the men played more like a team when Michael scored 30 or less points than they did when he was the soloist. Mm -hmm. That's why Kobe can't find a, a winning team because Kobe can't figure this out. Kobe's got to be the one always. But see, Michael listened to his coach and Michael backed out and scored in the 25, 30 range and dropped off. But his players said, come on, we got to help Michael tonight. He's not hitting all of them. And they came forward and they won six NBA championships. Come on. Why? Because they became a coalition of the willing. Are you listening to me today? Oh, I, I, I have something else I want to tell you about this now. Um, let's do it right now. Turn this little interview on. I want to watch, I want you to watch something. Hold it. Don't play it yet. Just hold it. Hold it. Get it ready. This little interview I'm going to show you is important to make my point. It won't be long. It's just a few minutes. But I want you to hear some key words. So those of you that have a tendency to sleep, <laughs> don't miss this. Okay? Put that interview on right now. Hopefully you have it. Lights off or down. Don't have to be off, but down. One, two, three. And we need sound. Uh, yeah. Part of many memorable games you played last week at yeah. the last home game. Yeah. Where's this in stack up? Wow. Um, God is amazing. I That's a big guy, isn't it? <laughs> probably look back at it down. It'll probably be one of the, one of the greatest victories in Ravens history. You know, and... and it's probably because of the way everything was stacked up against us, you know, <clears throat> coming in and, you know, I, I just challenged my team, you know, this week to, to not listen to anything outside of our building, you know, to, to, to buy into who we are as a team, you know, everything that we've been through injury-wise. And, and now for us to be here, like I said again, I, I just think this, this probably will go to – Go down is probably one of his greatest victories in Ravens history. Not very many people are giving you uh, much of a chance. How does it feel to extend your career, yeah. a few more games, and uh, end uh, Peyton Manning's season? You know what? I, I uh, wow. You know, there's so much respect that I have for Peyton. You know, him and his wife is outside waiting on me now. You know, because of how great of friends we became through the years, and to. To extend it now, you know, to, to know whenever the road stops, you know, that it won't be the end, that it's just a new beginning. But to do it like this, to, to do it for my teammates, to do it for my children, who's my greatest inspiration, and then to do it for my city, you know, there's, there's no other reason you do it. And if you was to go out any other way, man, I, I challenge people to fight your darnness to go out this way, to feel what that ride feels like, to look in men's eyes and get everybody to buy in. And when you get everybody to buy in, it's just so special when you see it, you know, comes to fruition because then it, it changes perspective on what we should pay attention to, you know. I, I went down to uh, John Hopkins Thursday night. A friend of mine called me, asked me to come see some kids. And when I walked in there and I'm looking at these babies, you know, who, who are unfortunate because they have to be there. And it just, it took everything away, you know, because I, I made a mistake before, you know, before the AFC championship, you know, and a very ill child I was supposed to go see before that game. And I never got a chance to see him off. I never got a chance to say my last goodbyes to him. And this time, when the call came, I had to go do it. You know, I put my iPad down, and I let study and take care of itself, you know. I had studied so much, and to go look at those kids and listen to the things that they were asking me just to keep going on in life, just to ask for opportunity in life, it's why you, it's why you do what you do. It's, it's why you sacrifice everything you do. And, and there's just no greater reward, man. Yeah. Such an emotional week last week. Yeah. Did you think that you could top it this week? And does this top 
last week? On, <laughs> one thing about the playoffs is the only way to top it is win the following week. Because <laughs> if you don't, then you're home. And, and <clears throat> pull it into the stadium, you know. Just like our city. Every city deserves certain respect. Coming in here, I applaud the Denver fans because they're loyal. And you see it. And, but there's only one way to cap last week, and that was win this week. And that's what, as a team, we spoke about. Come on. You know, what if we do the impossible? You know? Come on. Man says that it's not possible. But God says, I do the impossible. And for us to come in here and win, being nine, ten point underdogs, that's, what, that's, the beautiful, that's the beautiful part about sports. That's the thing that if I'll probably miss anything about my career, it will be to listen to what people say you can't do and then go do it. Because it's just special when you end it that way and when you do what we've done. You know, the plane ride, man, I, I just, it's going to be so awesome. But more importantly, our city, those kids are deep, they're deeply rooted in my heart because I know that they, they wish for an opportunity like this and never, will never get it probably one day. So if I can give anything back, it's faith, hope, or love. And it's just, man, it's, it's overwhelming. I tell you, the energy that you, you, you give out to come and play this game the way we played the game today. I've never been a part of a game so crazy in my life, you know, and to, um, to end it like that. I think the only game I remember, you know, Chad has been around a long time with me, you know. I call him friend, but, you know, so. But I think he will remember, you know, in 2000, we was down to Jacksonville like that. And, and we made a drive at the end of that game. And we won that game 39-36. And Shannon, Tony Banks hit Shannon across the middle for a last second win. And when Tuck got ready to kick that field goal, I just dropped my head and I just started reciting our Father's Prayer and just started to simply say, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Because now it's God's will. And when it's his will, you can never see the beginning of it. You can only see the end of it. And that's why I brought my team together at halftime. And just I wanted us, us all to touch and agree and repeat that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And no, and no matter what happened, when that field, when that kickoff return went back, we never wavered. We never wavered. We claimed victory on our sideline. And if you learn nothing else about the game of sports, <clears throat> is that when you make up your mind to do something collectively as people, Come anything is possible. Come on. When everybody buys in. You can't have wavering spirits because it's going to take away from the energy. And for what we did today, man, I applaud, I applaud my team. Yeah. yeah. Do you start feeling maybe this team is special? I mean, I think we're special just because of what we've been through all year. You know, injury-wise, you know, for the first time last week, that was the first time okay. me, Terrell Suggs, Ed Reed, and Lloyd and I actually played together. Peter. You know, Go ahead. Because of off. the injuries we've dealt with. You Turn know, lights I'm back. About injuries that people don't come back. How many of you heard what he was saying? Yes. How many of you heard over and over and over the team of the willing? Yes. The, the whole aspect that he had in his head and the whole aspect of the thing was is that they came together. When they came together, they couldn't be defeated. Right. Come on, saints. Now, this is just a game, and I'm not here. Those of you that are Steelers fans, too bad. But this is just, this is just my stage. I have the mic, so suffer. Get over it. Just a joke. Some are offended now in their backslide. My point is this. I watched that and felt inspiration. And, and really, it's just one piece of life, but it works in every part of our life. Yes. If I were to put a married couple here that were having struggles and, and, and they would put themselves into a preferring attitude and uh, an attitude of coming together, a coalition of the willing, I'm willing to give up, I'm willing to sacrifice, I'm willing to go all the way, I'm willing to give in, I'm willing to do. How many of you know, at that point, that marriage can't be defeated. 
And saints, it's the church. Uh, the church has been so scattered and so fragmented and so dis. Uh, combobulated and, and disunified. If we in this church begin to come and put our hearts together, put our hands together, put our minds together, we can't be defeated. Let me get you to the end here. I wanted to throw that in. Paul always names people in his letters because they are always people working with him. Acts 16.10, Paul says something. after He said, after Paul had seen the vision, he said, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. Who's the we? You see, we write these things. How many of you remember Lewis and Clark? Anybody know what they did? How many of you know in the Smithsonian Institute, there's a big uh, like um, wax figure of Lewis and Clark expedition. And they're in a canoe or by a canoe. You seen it? Okay, now how many of you know every picture that we get, we get the Lewis and Clark expedition, two guys. They were really part of an organization called the Corps of Discovery and there was 50 men that were on the journey with them. But you only hear about Lewis and Clark. You hear the bulls, you hear about Michael. Hello? You hear about the ravens and you hear about Ray. You heard the, uh, the, the Broncos and you heard about Peyton. How many of you know, saints, behind uh, that set man, that set person, and, and, and I say it in my own personal life, listen, what you see with me in the church is only a fragment of what really makes this church do because there are so many that are all scattered throughout that make things like this, the stage and things look so awesome and make the sounds uh, and, and the music and the singing and the nurseries and the, and the, and the, and the food and all that we do. It's because it's a coalition of the willing. My heart today is to challenge you. Are you part of something? Or are you just part of yourself? Are you part of something that says, I want to join the coalition of the willing? I want to be a part of moving the kingdom of God forward. Amen. And some of you, well, Bishop Pierre, no, 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 I just told you. It's like my marriage. If you know anything about me, it's because this woman, she's the prainest woman I ever met. She prays every morning. I don't care where we're at. She prays every day. Prays every day. She's in the Word every day. Not occasionally. Not, on, not you know, when she feels all the time. Are you listening? And the reason that God lets us do anything is because we have the coalition of the willing. Her and I are willing to give up. We're willing to sacrifice. She's willing to go to a gun show. <laughs> Hello. Some of you ladies need to take notes on that. You're not willing. Wow. Now listen, going alone is not God's way, and I'm going to bring it down to an end. Genesis 2:18, God said, "It was not good that man should be alone." Have you know God's beginning in creation said it's not good that man be alone, saints. I want to tell you something. The person on your left and the person on your right, you need them. Yes. And, and, and look again at Titus chapter 3, verse 13. There's a strong partnership between the believers and even the business world. That's why we bring in a guy like uh, uh, Ed Taros is because we want business included uh, in the, 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 the ministry of the church. We want both uh, the kingdom, uh, uh, you know, king ministry, and we want the priest ministry. We want the, the world's, uh, uh, the, the, the job market, you know, the, the business market. We want the, the, the whole aspect of the church functioning. Yeah. How do you hear that? Yeah. In, in February, we'll have a couples meeting for a day or a night or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, Man, I would want all the couples to be here. Why? So that we can collectively make a statement that God believes in restored marriages and healthy marriages. Are you listening to me? You see, I model some things in my life, and I'm not here to boast, but I'm here to tell you. I've been married 42 years. That's a good testimony. 
Hello? Well, I can't say that. I've been married 42 years with the same woman. <laughs> That's a whole nother. And I know what success is. I've owned my own businesses. I know success. But I know how if you have a coalition of the willing, there's nothing you can't do. Ray Lewis and that team. How many of you know if you had a guy like uh, a Lodinata playing in front of you, you'd be good too. <laughs> Come on. How many of you know it's, it's the team? Are you listening to me today? Now, look at this. Watch these steps. This is important. God is linking together doctors, lawyers, carpenters, teachers, accountants, police, artists, and many others together to become a team that brings it all together to impact a divided nation and a divided city. The city Paul spent the winter in, remember, look at it, it's in Titus. What was it called? Nicholas or Nicopolis. Now, Nicopolis is this. It is the word Nike. It means victory. So Paul took the winner in a city called Victory City. How many of you know when you have a time to sit back and relax, you need to make sure you're in a place of victory, not a place of defeat? Come on. He chose a place to winterize. He chose a place to plant himself so that he could strategize and get strong. And he chose a little place that was called Nike, a place of victory. How many of you know the Nike sign is appropriate with the Ravens and the talk about the uh, Michael Jordan? It's because God wants us to catch this message today. Are you listening to me? Going alone is not God's way. And going broke is not God's way. Amen. Do everything you can to help Zenos, the, Zenos, the, Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need, Paul said. How many of you hear what he was saying? Paul sent out a letter and he said, look, I'm sending a couple guys out. Make sure they don't have any need. Are you listening to me? How do you know if the church becomes this coalition of the willing, we'll make sure there's no need. We'll make sure that the need is always met, that those that labor and those that work in the house of God have supply and those that uh, uh, come and be uh, trained and go out, there's always supply. Come on, how do you know the church needs to realize it has a role in the sending of its missionaries? Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And, and, and when you read Titus there, you see what he says. Do everything you can to help the lawyer and Apollos on their way see that they have everything they need. You know, God's not raining down man and quail anymore, saints, unless I'm missing it. So it is the local church's job to see that they have everything they need to bring God's kingdom to bear in this city. How many of you hear that? Amen. Can you imagine the ravens going on the field and they didn't have enough money to afford shoes or helmets? Or That'd be kind of crazy, wouldn't it? And yet the church sends out its missionaries all over the world and they send them out broke. They send them out where they can't even meet their needs to eat hardly. And they know that sacrifice is a part, yes. But how many of you know the church has become comfortable of consuming for itself while it sends out its broken, poor, and those that have need? Are you listening to me? Yes. How many of you know to send somebody into a mission field today? They got to be a unique character. That's why America's not leading anymore in sending out missionaries. America used to lead, but it doesn't lead anymore. China is going to be the leading country in the world that sends out missionaries. You know why? I, I know in, in Botswana, they sent out Chinese missionaries there, but they sent businessmen with every group of the church people. And they went into these places. One of my friends, he built a church and he couldn't get the, he built a church for 4,000 in, Zimb uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, and... Uh, and because of it, he couldn't build the, the church. But because of it, the Chinese businessman loaned them the money like a bank. But it came out of the Chinese uh, businessman. And that's how come they got to build the church. 
because everybody else was going around poor in the mouth and couldn't have anything, didn't have any resources. And here's the Chinese stepping up and saying, hey, we'll supply. Something missing in the picture, isn't it, saints? We send out a missionary and we say, okay, we're sending you to Wabba Wabba land. Hope you, you know, do well. Pray. Raise your own money. Don't call me for any help. Hello. And then they're out there and they're poor and they got kids they're trying to bring in to feed or to help. My pastor friend from, uh, he's been here and preached, from Uganda has massive works for young people and kids they outreach to. They build these orphanages. They're marvelous. And AIDS is such a massive uh, enemy uh, of those people in Uganda. And yet what happens is they come to the church and the church says, bless you. I mean, you know, Jesus told the example that if you walk by somebody and you see them begging for food, don't say bless you. Give them something to eat. Come on, saints. You see, because what we've done is we've said, Lord, we're so blessed. Uh, Keep blessing me so I can be blessed and add blessing to my blessing. But we're not reading what Paul said to Titus. Titus, uh, he said, young man, remember the lawyer, Zenos. And he said, remember Apollos. Don't send them out broke. Send them out with something. How do you hear that? How many of you know if I wanted to start a work right now in some country that, that we could really have an impact and the Lord burdened my heart and led me to do that? How many of you know I wouldn't be able to do it? Because the ones that God has blessed have cut off the supply system. So there's no blessing going out beyond their own front porch. Have you know the coalition of the willing means will pray? Have you know prayer is important for any mission we do? Come on, how do you believe we have to have prayer? But how do you know, saints, if I start a work in one of these countries somewhere and God lays it on our hearts, all the prayer in the world may not put a single piece of food on the table. Do you understand that? We've been praying for Pakistan. We've been praying for Afghanistan. I have a church in Pakistan. Poor. Oh, my God. And for six grand, they could have a piece of land to build a church. They were were renting and had a church building on it, and the owner decided he didn't want them to have a Christian thing on his land, so he went in and tore the building down so they couldn't use the building anymore. So they have no church to meet in. We dedicated him to the Lord, his child recently. I did a, uh, what do you call it, Um, a Skype and dedicated his new child, new boy, Jeremiah, to the Lord. Happiest people, thrilled. And they need six grand. I'm not here to raise six grand for them. I'm here preaching to you today. Because saints, there's got to come some time where the heart of the willing begins to, to rise up. Not the heart of the coerced. Not the heart of the pressured but the heart of the willing that says, you know what? I I really, I don't want to just have, I want to be a a channel. I want to be a a, a vehicle of blessing. I want others to be blessed. I want to join the coalition of the willing so that we can have an impact on the nations. How many of you here today listening? How many of you know it's a shame when the church constantly we say, bring some food, and people bring a few cans. And I guarantee you got more food in your, stu- in your, in your house than some people will see in a month. But it's because we're not a coalition of the willing. There's a few. But how do you say, if everybody in this room had brought a can today, the cans would probably be over to the other side. But see, we're only a part of the club we're not a part of the willing. I'm going to close with prayer. You still listening? Yes. You say, well, that was a good message until you went over here. I liked all that Ray Lewis stuff and all. Now you're, now you're walking down my, my, my lane in my house. God's not raising people today, saints, 
to be bystanders. There's a strong ending to this, though. It says in this letter, look at it again. Put the scripture up there, guys. It says not to live unproductive lives. I've come all the way around, all the way back to it. This is God's way, God's people going forth in teams, freely giving resources for the end time harvest. Teams going and teams growing. Yeah. Have you say, Lord, I want to be a part yeah. of an end time revolution, an end time harvest, an end time yeah. uh, coalition that makes a difference. Yeah. How many of you know that even today, some of the very things that we've done over all the years, we are hindered to do because we have to say we can't. Why? Because Christmas came. Think about it. We can't feed people because we all wanted to buy more gifts than we needed. So I asked you the question. How many of you today say, Lord, I need to get willing to give my life to God. I need to be willing to give my resource to God. I need to be willing to give my everything over to God. And Lord, as Isaiah said, could you use me, Lord? Here am I. Stand on your feet and I'll pray with you. Do you know over the week, over the month of December, I have a paper in my hand that's pretty amazing, I wanted to tell you, as you stand just before I pray with you. Do you know that the little camera there that sends out our little video stream in America alone, in the month of December, 85,000 plus people tapped into our system. Just in America, saints. That's hits. That's some opening pages, some hitting it. Listen at the countries, Romania, Ukraine, Russia, China, Israel. Over 767 hits from Israel. Germany, India, Great Britain, Canada, South Korea, Japan, Pakistan, Moldova, Moldova, Singapore, Poland, France, European country, Indonesia, Madagascar, Norway, Lithuania, New Zealand, Kenya, Ghana, Philippines, Brazil, Australia, Sweden, Spain, Taiwan, Mexico, Bulgaria, Hungary, Egypt, uh, Vietnam, Austria, Switzerland, Trinidad, Tobago, uh, Vietnam, South Africa, Netherlands, uh, uh, Antilles, uh, Portugal, Denmark, Ireland. That's amazing, isn't it? And what message are we sending out to the world that hasn't heard the gospel? What message do we want to send today? I have the camera. It's on right now. We're somewhere right now around the world. Somebody in Pakistan, somebody in Germany, somebody in Israel, somebody in China, somebody around the world is potentially right now watching you watch me and listen to what God's saying. What message would you like to say today? You have the mic. You have a mic. What would you like to say to that audience of over 100,000 plus people? Would you like to say that our God is Jehovah Jireh? Would you like to say that our God is well able? Our God's a healer? How many of you would like to say that God is so good? There's nothing impossible, as Ray said. There's nothing impossible for God. How many of you would like to send that message to that audience? How many of you would like to send a message to the city? How many of you would like to send a message to your loved ones and neighbors? that God is Jehovah Jireh. He is our source. God can do anything. If God can save a, 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 a person like me, a drug addict, uh, God can save anybody. If God can, come on, if God can touch you, God can change. Come on, if God can. So, come on, saints. What message should we send today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. The church today, Lord. The church of the living God. What message are we sending out? When people sitting in grass huts, people sitting in places looking at a little 15 inch, 12 inch television screen, if they're fortunate. And here we are dressed in the finery of our 
opulence and blessing. What message do we want to send? Do we want to say that our God only takes care of us and your own, your own? Or do we want to say, Lord, help us today to be the coalition of the willing, to join together and make sure that everything we do has in mind that we're part of something bigger than just our own self and our own agenda. We're part of the body. We're part of a family. We're the church. The church of the living God. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Full of power, full of faith, full of hope, full of love. We're that church, Lord. We're that church. We're that church. And the enemy cannot rob that. The enemy cannot steal that from us. We repent today, Lord, of going through the motions, allowing ourselves to be self-centered, totally focused on my, me agendas instead of, here I am, Lord, use me, send me. Father, I pray all over this room that somebody here today might need you, might need your touch. Somebody watching the video today or watching the live video stream might need your touch. Today, Lord, we want to testify that you are God and that you are Jehovah God and that you are able to do abundantly above and beyond what we could ask or think. God, we are a people that are excited about the kingdom of God and about the purpose of God. And we shout and we testify, how good is our God? those of you standing here right now maybe eyes closed and no one looking around this is not a, 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 a you know spectator sport this is about getting serious and about being real and about approaching God and saying Lord can my life count and how is my life counting is my life fruitful Am I bearing fruit, God, for your kingdom today? Father, in Jesus' name, all over this room, as we look so hard into our own hearts and souls, not at the person near us or not at the person standing around us, but we look within our own self and say, who am I and where am I today? Can God use me today? Maybe you stand there, you say, I need the Lord. Oh, I need the Lord. I need him in my life. I came today because I need more of God. I need Jesus in my life today. Heads are bowed and we're praying and no one's looking around. If that's you standing here today and you say with me, I need Jesus in my life. I want you to pray with me and I want you to stand right where you're at and, and just say, Pastor, it's me. If you would, slip your hand up and let me pray with you right where you stand. Say, it's me today, preacher. I need Jesus in my life. Uh, hold your hand up there so I can pray my best prayer. Just hold it up and say, it's me. Today, I need the Lord. Yes, yes, uh, yes, I see the hand back there. Anybody else? Hold it up. I'm gonna pray my best. And yes, I see your hand. And yes, I see your hand. Uh, it's all right. Uh, listen, I did this many years ago. I prayed a simple prayer prayer and it changed my life forever. I never had to go back to jail again. Thank you, Jesus, uh, for those that are being real here right now. Those of you with your hand up, hold it up one last time so I can see it to pray. Don't be ashamed of it. God's not ashamed of you. Hold it up, hold it up. Yes, yes, yes. Hold it up so I can see it uh, and I'm going to pray my best prayer. Yes, yes, yes. Over here, I see that hand. Uh, anybody else? Hold it up. Here's what I want you to do. Come quickly and let us pray with you. Come quickly and stand right here and so we can pray this prayer. Quickly, I want to pray two prayers and I want you to come. That's right, come on, so that you can pray this prayer. Just slip out of your seat. Come on, you raise your hand. Just come down right now so we can pray. We have people here waiting to pray with you. We have people waiting to pray with you. It's a simple prayer. Oh my Lord, I've never seen people so afraid of prayer. Come on, sweetheart, that's right. I've never seen people afraid of prayer. How can you be afraid of prayer when you're not afraid of drugs or you're not afraid of lying or you're not afraid of going to hell, but you're afraid of prayer? How silly is that? 
Come on, let's pray. Let's pray right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you. Come on, come on. Get somebody. Hook up with them and pray with them. Come on, there's a lady coming in the back. Get her hooked up with them so we can pray the best prayer we got. Father, put your hands out this way, saints. Father, we pray right now for those at this altar. May the day be the best day they've ever had. May the day be the beginning. May the day be the changing point. I declare in the name of Jesus that there'll be a change that comes in their life. There'll be a change that comes in their life right now. In the name of Jesus, this thing will change today. They'll not go back to their old way. They'll not go back to their old plans, their old agendas. But today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Household salvation. Household salvation. Household salvation. Counselors, make sure, make sure, make sure they have all that they need. Make sure that you don't just stand with them in your hand. Make sure they have them. Make sure they go away with a name, with a pad, with a, with a tape, whatever it is they need. Make sure they do that so that they don't just fall away and miss what God has. Father, we thank you for this. This is a great morning for them, Lord. We thank you for it. We thank you for their lives. Baptize them. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Lord, change them. Let this be a life-changing moment, God. They never again have to go the way they've gone. Never again. Never again. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Counselors. Thank you. I need you to take them and go right to the prayer room. Take them right to the prayer room so that I can finish the service. I've got a prayer to do. So I just need you to walk with them. And the prayer room is right behind us. And uh, you'll be right back in two seconds. Just a blink of the eye. But you need to move that way so that I can do what I need to do. That's right. Just go with them. They're going to take you and pray with you. And then they're going to bring you right back. Those of you still here, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Come on. Isn't that wonderful? Give the Lord praise, would you? Now, here's what I need you to do. How many of you heard the message today? How many of you believe that if the church is going to be the coalition, that we have to fund what God wants us to do? How many of you believe that? How many believe you can't have the church if it doesn't have the funding? It ain't coming out of manna. It ain't coming out of the heavens. How many of you hear that? How many of you like coming to Rock City Church? How many of you like what God's doing? Well, let me ask you to do this. Put the plates up here quickly. I need you to do this. I need you to make a difference right now. We didn't say anything all the way through Christmas, all the way through the first weeks of uh, January. We let it go. One of the worst times the church ever has in America is during Christmas. It's the worst time for the church. Missionaries go without food. Missionaries go without provision during Christmas while America celebrates its own pleasure. I know personal ministries that have gone completely under in the last two weeks just because we had Christmas. Because people forget how important it is to sow and be part of this coalition of the blessed. Let's make sure, like Paul said, that Zenos and Apollos have everything they need. How you know it takes a lot to bring people to the Lord like this, the counsel with them, work with them, help them in their lives. How many of you know that's a process? That's why we have staff that comes in. That's why we have people that come and sit and talk with them and help them work through their issues of life. But it's because of you that we can make the difference. And how many of you today agree with me? We need to make a difference. How many of you agree? Come on. Do you agree we need to make a difference? All right, here's what I want you to do. Prayerfully, I want you to write a check. I want you to give an offering. But I don't want you to just tip God. I want you to do something with significant saints so that we can get through that window and keep moving. Like I said, I left it alone. I didn't say a word through Christmas, through all of the holiday, through those things. I didn't say a word of the need. Now I'm there at this point, and I need to say to you, let's be the coalition of the willing. Put your 
faith up with me and let's pray. Father, thank you. Put your hand up. Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you today. We agree that the faithful, Lord, we agree that the coalition of the willing have to be willing to sacrifice, have to be willing to go the extra mile, have to be willing to give a, a little bit more and the extra at times so that, Lord, the work of the kingdom will continue to go unabated. God will continue to have its impact. Lord, like these couples and young people we saw at the altar here today, Lord, we want to see a whole generation of kids come out of jail and come out of the streets and get saved. And Lord, we can't wait till the eternity play comes and we can see hundreds and thousands come to you. Lord, that's who we are. We're, we're, we're reaching souls and we're touching lives. But it's because of the body of Christ, the church of the willing, that we're going to make this difference. So Father, today, would you speak to every man and woman in this room? There are people here today that can do extra, Lord. I ask that you speak to them. I ask that you speak to them and that they do extra today to make a difference. Now, Father, I thank you. We rejoice in this altar call. We rejoice in the graduations of these children. We rejoice in all that you're doing in our midst. So we're going to be the church of the willing. In Jesus' name, look at me. Turn to somebody and say, you know, you're part of the church of the willing. Tell them, tell somebody. They're part of the church of the willing. Church of the willing. I'm willing to do what? I'm willing to pray. I'm willing to give. I'm willing to love. Be willing today to give extra. Would you do that? Come and sow now. Come and bring that free will offering and sow extra for the kingdom. Come on.